On behalf of the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice, I welcome you to the third and final installment of the inaugural USF Lecture Series in the History of Jewish-Christian Relations. Good evening to you all. My name is Jeremy Brown, and I'm the series director. I'd like to express my thanks to the USF Department of Theology and Religious Studies, as well as the Joan and Ralph Lane Center for Catholic Studies and Social Thought for co-sponsoring with us on this exciting new program. Uh, I want to mention the names of key individuals, two key individuals who have been instrumental in helping me to realize this initiative, namely THRS Program Assistant Monica Doblado. It's her birthday today, so happy birthday, Monica. Uh, and Professor Aaron Hahn Tapper. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the following Bay Area community organizations, the San Francisco Interfaith Council, St. Dominic's Catholic Church, Blair House Judaica, and in particular, Congregation Beth Shalom and Grace Cathedral. Before proceeding, I'd like to say something about the JSSJ program. Founded in 2008, the USF SWIG program is the first and only program in the United States formally linking Jewish studies with social justice. Our program offers numerous courses related to this interdisciplinary field, such as the Jewish-Christian relationship, Jewish and Islamic mysticism, social justice, activism, and the Jews, the Jewish-American experience through graphic novels, Forgiving the Unforgivable, Jews, Judaisms, and Jewish Identities, as well as some new courses we're launching this fall, Refugees and Justice, Queering Religion, and Funny Jews, Shaping Jewish American Identities Through Comedy. Alongside these special course offerings, our program also offers a unique minor in Jewish studies and social justice. Further, each year we put on a number of annual events each fall, we have a speaker series related to Jewish identities, highlighting the rich diversity of Jews in terms of ethnicity, gender, national sensibilities, sex, sexual orientation, race, and other social identities. Last year, we held our first annual Human Rights Lecture Program when we brought Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire to campus, the head of UN forces in Rwanda, uh, who refused orders to evacuate the East African nation when genocide began. Each spring semester, we hold an annual social justice lecture and an annual social justice Passover Seder, addressing events such as, uh, themes such as poverty in Haiti, genocide in Chad, the Sudan, and the Congo, as well as gender justice. Finally, we offer unique educational programs related to the transformation of national conflicts, such as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We regularly partner with a number of different Bay Area organizations, such as the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco, as well as local synagogues and mosques. This spring, in addition to tonight's program, we have one more event on our roster, uh, which, like tonight's event, is free and open to the general public, and it takes place here on campus. In one week, on Thursday, April 13th, we will have our eighth annual Social Justice Passover Seder, where, where we'll focus on the imperative to treat all of those living within the political boundaries of the US with justice, regardless of their documentation. The Seder will be co-led by social justice activist, acclaimed writer and poet, Andrew Raymer, who's joined us this evening, uh, who is here tonight, uh, uh, in the front row, uh, together with a representative from uh, Ben the Ark, a leading progressive Jewish organization who's not here tonight. Um, uh, and uh, if you're interested in being put on the JSSJ listserv, please add your name to the sign up sheet, which is just outside uh, the, the Murawski room. Now let's get started. So, anyone who was here for the past two Wednesday evenings uh, has heard me uh, lay out my seven basic objectives for the series. So tonight, uh, I will be brief in restating my aims to leave some time to give one concise example of why I think the history of Jewish-Christian relations is so relevant for understanding the world we live in, regardless of whether or not you identify as a Jew or a Christian. Uh, so here are the seven names. Uh, the series aims to promote historical understanding from a relational perspective, to focus on polemical constructions of religious identity, to reflect on the dangers of polemical rhetoric, especially when directed at vulnerable populations, to foster an historically critical sense of community identity, 
to address the relevance of Jewish-Christian relations for students of any or no religious background, to make Jewish-Christian relations scholarship accessible to the broader community, and lastly, to stimulate scholarship, especially scholarship that's happening here in the Bay Area. Um, in the interest of framing what we're doing in terms of which are compelling in light of the problems of our present moment, I want now to give an example of how the history of Jewish-Christian relations informs the politics of contemporary religious practice. Next week, Jews all over the world will commemorate the festival of Passover, and Christians observe the rites of Holy Week, culminating in Easter Sunday. Historically speaking, tensions between Christians and Jews has often reached their highest pitch during just this time of year. Much of this tension can be attributed to the ritualized antagonism of Jews, by Christians as persecutors of Jesus during Holy Week. Such antagonism is especially apparent during the commemoration of Good Friday, when many Christians since the Middle Ages have dramatized Jesus' sufferings in high-profile public spaces through the staging of Passion Plays. In these plays, the conflict between Jews and the Pharisees, sorry, between Jesus and the Pharisees described in the canonical Gospels is performed by actors with the Jews clearly marked as diabolical villains driving the conspiracy against the innocent Nazarene. Our course, to, of course, <clears throat> it's not a stretch to draw a causal link between such diabolical characterizations and the incitement of popular Christian animosity and even violence towards Jews. Throughout the long and varied history of the Passion Play productions from medieval Germany to the present day Philippines, the figure of Judas Iscariot is consistently cast as a prototypical embodiment of Jewish evil. In particular, the, the cathartic enactment of Judas's suicide by hanging and evisceration has captivated generations of devoted spectators. And here's a, an image from uh, a medieval manuscript of Judas hanging by the tree. The horrific image of a Jew hanging from a tree has functioned as a potent symbol of the insufferable burden of Jewish guilt and as a vindication of Jesus' perfect innocence. In medieval German passion play scripts, we find stage directions indicating how this scene should be performed. And in one instance, we read a description of how the young priest who played this role should conceal within his costume a leather sack containing pig entrails and a live black squirrel. When suspended from the gallows, the actor is directed to burst open the sack, ejecting the intestines from his torso and liberating the black squirrel representing Judas's dark, demonic soul to scamper off into the netherworld. In other instances, the actor would let loose a black raven to produce a similar effect. Actors roped into playing this role, pardon the gallows humor, uh, quickly realized that they were dealing with some very treacherous occupational hazards. In 1437, during a production in Metz, a young priest playing the part nearly died when uh, dangling with a noose around his neck. Fast forward to 2012, a 27-year-old man named Chago Klimek accidentally killed himself playing the role in a Good Friday Passion Play performed in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. News sources reported that four whole minutes passed before spectators, thinking the limp body, a theatrical flourish, <coughs> recognized that something had gone awry. In view of the dangers of having actors stage the hanging, many productions opted instead to hang an effigy of Judas. One year ago, in uh, 2016, amid the fever pitch of Mexican outrage against candidate Trump's anti-Latino and anti-immigrant slander, Mexico City ignited in a religious demonstration of anti-Trump sentiment. Last year, paper mache Judas effigies, which for generations have been hung and burned in public settings throughout the city, were fashioned in the candidate's image. Here are some, uh, some images, and these are from, uh, from Mexico City again from last year.
This particular Judas Trump effigy was crafted by Felipe Linares, an artisan whose family has been making Judas figures in, in the La Merced neighborhood for Holy Week for over 50 years. While I'm not in the habit of predicting the future, I would be rather su surprised if we did not see repetitions of this phenomenon on an even broader scale next week, particularly now, post-inauguration. One of the reasons I draw your attention to this particular issue is because it demonstrates in a very tangible way how an important motif in the history of Jewish-Christian relations continues to engender new meaning and dimensionality. The narrative of Jesus' persecution by Jews, and by Judas in particular, serves as a template for rendering contemporary struggles against tyranny meaningful. In this performance, such struggles are reflected in the mirror of medieval and even ancient religious paradigms. The dramatic practice of burning Judas Trump effigies may, in fact, yield a potentially productive kind of political empowerment for, me for Mexican Catholics. However, it must be pointed out that such expressions, for all of their redemptive promise, run the risk of mobilizing old Christian anti-Jewish values in the pursuit of political and religious empowerment. To sharpen the contradiction, the performance effectively rehearses xenophobic stereotypes in the struggle against xenophobia. Tonight's lecture will go into greater depth about the modern ramifications of another very old Christian preoccupation with respect to the Jews, namely the determination to win Jewish souls in conversion. Tonight, we are truly fortunate to welcome current Guggenheim Fellow Professor Naomi Seidman of the Graduate Theological Union. Among other works, Professor Seidman is the author of A Marriage Made in Heaven, The Sexual Politics of Hebrew and Yiddish, published in 1997 by UC Press, Faithful Renderings, Jewish-Christian Difference in the Politics of Translation, published in 2010 by the University of Chicago Press, The Marriage Plot, or How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature, published just last year by Stanford University Press, as well as a forthcoming book on, edu on the education of Orthodox Jewish girls in interwar Poland. Seidman is also the 2016-2017 recipient of the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship for Senior Scholars. Her contribution to the lecture series is titled A Gift for the Jewish People, the Yiddish New Testament, and the 20th Century Mission to the Jews. After the lecture, Professor Aaron Brigham, director of USF's Lane Center, will engage Professor Seidman in conversation, and then we'll have an open Q&A to follow with the public. So please join me in welcoming on the day before her birthday, no less, Professor Naomi Seidman. Somehow in the internet, the question mark after the title phrase got lost. Ah. A gift for the Jewish people? <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's very sweet to... I met Jeremy in a class at the GTU, so it's really nice to see him here running the world. Um, and thank you, Aaron, for responding. And I don't know, there are probably people working behind the scenes, or are you doing everything? You were doing everything. So thank you for that, too. I just want to make sure I know how to work this thing. Okay. So among the very first Yiddish books ever printed, was the convert Paul Halich's translation of the New Testament. Halich's translation was published in 1540, only six years after he founded the first Yiddish press, and three years after he converted to Roman Catholicism. To put this in context, Martin Luther's German <coughs> New Testament translation had appeared in 1522, only 18 years earlier. The timing of this last detail is no coincidence. Despite being a new Catholic, Halich was happy to ride Luther's coattails, relying on the overlap between German and Yiddish to produce a Yiddish translation that was more or less a transcription of Luther's German in Hebrew characters. And I'm wondering if everybody understands what the relationship is between Yiddish and German, so maybe I'll just say, is that uh, Yiddish is a, is Another name for Yiddish is Judeo-German. Um, basically, everywhere Jews went, 
they spoke the language of their co-religionists and they wrote it in Hebrew characters and writing it in Hebrew characters, um, it, it basically is German with some Jewish <coughs> Hebrew words put in. So it's very easy to take Luther's German New Testament translation and just write it in Hebrew letters and you get a Yiddish New Testament. So that's what I meant by it's no coincidence that 18 years after Luther translated his Bible into German, somebody looking to, probably looking to make a quick buck, actually why he did this is, is a complicated question, but somebody was very easily able to get a new book out by more or less tra transcribing Luther's German into, into Hebrew letters to produce a Yiddish translation. Halich's technique set the pattern for the Yiddish New Testament translations that were published in the 17th and the 18th centuries, which similarly took advantage of the closeness between Yiddish and German to ease their translational path. But the most sustained efforts to proselytize Jews through the New Testament translations occurred in the 19th and 20th centuries and were initiated by the British rather than German missionaries. In the two centuries since the British and Foreign Bible Society was founded in London in 1804, initially to serve the poor, but rather quickly to serve the entire planet, the Bible in part or, or in whole was translated into more than a thousand languages, among them a significant number in Jewish languages. By 1851, the Bible Society reported translations not only into Hebrew, Hebrew and Yiddish, but also into Judeo-Spanish, Judeo-German, Judeo-Arabic, and Judeo-Persian. Bible societies also produced a number of parallel editions designed to appeal to Jews, with the Hebrew New Testament on the right, and German, French, Hungarian, Italian, Russian, Polish, Turkish, English, Romanian, Portuguese, or Yiddish on the left-facing pages. In many respects, these Jewish language translations were no different from the thousand other Bible translations produced by Bible societies. As part of the founding principle of the Bible societies, these translations skirt doctrinal controversy by avoiding notes or commentary. But just as in other translations directed toward non-Jews, editors and publishers found ways around these restrictions to communicate with specific readers. Bible societies disseminated not only official reports, but also sentimental stories of the powerful <coughs> effect of the New Testament on Jews as on other prospective converts, although these stories are perhaps less believable in the Jewish case. Thus, one missionary reported that a Jewish woman described the Yiddish New Testament as heavenly words, which are so comforting to a widow's heart. Another missionary described approaching Jewish immigrants on board a ship bound for America who were so eager to hear the Christian message that they fought for a New Testament in Yiddish. For all the congruence between the broader project of global evangelism and the mission to the Jews, the translations produced for Jews inevitably had some unique characteristics given the special nature of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. Jews were particularly prized converts as evidenced by references in Bible society literature to the ministry of special importance. Jewish born converts were particularly valued as informants and language experts Sorry, did I lose track of, what number is that? Okay, Jewish born converts were particularly valued as informants and language experts, not only in the target language of missionary publications, but also in the sources to be translated, a role with deep roots in the Christian, <coughs> the historical Christian reliance on Jewish experts for knowledge of the Bible and for Hebrew. Jews were more likely than other converts to rise um, in the ranks of these Bible societies. One prominent example is Christian David Ginsburg, a Bible scholar active in the Liverpool chapter of the L London Mission to the Jews, 
who after the death of Isaac Edward Salkinson, another Russian-born convert, completed his Hebrew New Testament, a text that is still in general, general circulation. The unique relationship between Christianity and Judaism also reflected itself on a linguistic level. Christianity was more familiar to the Jews than it was, say, to the New Caledonians or the Thai. Jews had long lived among Christians and shared a sacred text and many religious concepts with them. Unlike Mongolian, for instance, which lacked words not only for Messiah and Sabbath, but also for palm tree and pomegranate, Jewish languages possessed a rich vocabulary from which the New Testament translator could draw. In the case of Hebrew, translators sometimes reported that their experiences were less of translation than a retroversion, that is, of uncovering the lost original of a translated text. The Baptist minister, Robert Lindsay, working on a Hebrew translation of the Gospel of Mark in Jerusalem in the 1960s, wrote that his work gave him the frightening feeling that I was as much in the process of restoring an original Hebrew work as in creating a new one. And he spoke of the tantalizing possibi possibility that he was discovering the exact words of Jesus himself. I'll just read this. And if, you know, for those of you who know some Hebrew, it's an uncanny feeling hearing the, uh, the Lord's Prayer. I forgot what it was called for a second. I'm very uh, sleep deprived. That's why it's good I have this. Um, it sounds more or less just like any other Hebrew prayer. You say it without thinking anything. You're saying a Christian prayer that sounds entirely native in Hebrew. For Matthew, the gospel richest in Hebraisms and sometimes believed to be a Greek translation of an original lost Hebrew text, this effect was even more pronounced. Verse 121 in Matthew. Okay, guys, you're at USF. What's verse 121 in Matthew? Do you know it by heart? No, nobody. Okay. Um, and he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's the King James Version. That verse makes sense only in Hebrew translation. What's the relationship between calling him Jesus and having him have something to do with translation, with salvation? Hebrew is the language in which the etymological connection between the name Jesus, what kind of Jewish name is that, right? And the concept of salvation is clear. And I'll, I'll just read from the Salkinson Ginsburg uh, Hebrew for those of you who can appreciate that finally we have a New Testament that makes sense. Vihi yoledet ben vikarata et shemo Yeshua, ki hu yoshia et amo mechatat mechatotehem. We'll call him Yeshua because he will yoshia et, you know, his people. That's an effect that's available in Hebrew translation. But all Jewish languages have Hebrew components, and these component, components could be mobilized to produce a similar effect. For Yiddish, such a recovery effect could only be achieved as long as translators were willing to leave behind the familiar language of Luther's Bible and mobilize a more idiomatic, more Jewish Yiddish, one which drew more fully on its Hebrew component. As I described, uh, Yiddish has a very strong German, um, let's say 85%, I mean, it depends who's Yiddish, is German, more or less straightforwardly German, but let's say about 15% is Hebrew. There are many words in which you could choose a Hebrew word, there are, there are doublets. There's a Hebrew word for it, and a Germ or a Hebrew derived word for it, or, and a German derived word for it. The word for month, you could say chaydesh, which is more or less a Hebrew word, or you could say manat, which is a German word. So you could choose often a Hebrew word. If you choose the Hebrew word, you're gonna get a more Jewish Yiddish. I hope that makes sense for those of you who didn't know anything about Yiddish. I see the people who probably know something about Yiddish shaking their hands. Okay, their heads. Um, such a fully Jewish Yiddish New Testament appeared 
only in 1941 with the publication of the Ritz Chadasha by Henry Chaim Einspruch, the long delay in producing a more idiomatic Yiddish translation can be attributed not only to the strong pull of Luther's canonical German New Testament and how easy it was to produce a Yiddish translation just by Hebraizing it, but um, this long delay can also be attributed to the stigma and distaste that Christians, converts, and beginning with the Enlightenment period, even Jews themselves felt for Yiddish, which was considered just a badly pronounced, considered a kind of bad German, why you're speaking the real language. Despite the fact that the Germanizing style um, would make missionary publications harder for Jews to understand, since it wasn't the language they were speaking, um, one, missionary, one missionary necessarily defended the German style by asking, how could a, a Jew possibly object to us Germans making an effort to cleanse our beloved mother tongue from the abominable mess and filth in which it is mired among the Jews? So that in this way as well, the hidden secret of Christ would shine forth in front of the eyes of the eclipsed Jewish religion with a brighter, purer, and lovelier radiance. For this missionary, by the way, I think an example of how Yiddish was seen is Ibanitz, right? That this idea that rather than a horrendously mispronounced form of Yiddish, this was an actual, or, or of English, this is an actual distinctive form of English, that's the same way that people came to think about Yiddish in the 20th century. But for this, for this German missionary who couldn't bear to have his beautiful New Testament ruined by being uh, expressed in this ridiculous language, didn't even deserve the name of a language, um, producing it in a Yiddish that was purified toward German was already a step toward a Judaism purified toward Christianity. Given the deep interconnections between conversion and translation, religious and linguistic shifts, a Lutheran Yiddish New Testament could pave the way to the baptismal font by already embodying the transformation it hoped to effect. The man who inaugurated the era of Yiddish retranslation of the New Testament, Henry Chaim Einspruch, was born into a Hasidic home in Poland and moved as a labor Zionist to Palestine in 1909, emigrating to America in 1913, and graduating from McCormick Theological Seminary in 1920. Notice that I haven't mentioned his conversion for the simple reason that Einspruch never converted to Christianity, deeming his allegiance to evangelical Lutheranism a fulfillment of, rather than a movement away from, his Judaism. He married an Amish woman, um, Marie Ehrlich, who died a few years ago at the age of 102. They reportedly communicated in an odd marital idiolect that combined her Pennsylvania Dutch and his Polish Yiddish. <laughs> Einspruch achieved a certain infamy in Baltimore for standing on a soapbox in front of various Orthodox synagogues on the Sabbath, preaching the good news in Yiddish to those leaving services. And there are people in Baltimore who still remember him. Despite Einspruch's affiliation with the United Lutheran Church, the new translation took its model not took as its model not Luther, but rather the Yiddish translation of the Hebrew Bible by Yehoyash, Solomon uh, Bloomgarden, which, was, which appeared in 1926 to great acclaim. Let's see where I have that, here we go. The presence of um, words derived from Hebrew in Einspruch's Yiddish are no doubt also an expression of his conception of, of Christianity or his own Christianity as a realization rather than disavowal of Jewishness. Um, along with other turn of the century Jewish Christians who formed separate congregations, Einspruch was a forerunner of the strand of Messianic Judaism 
in which adherents proudly keep their Jewish names, or sometimes even take on a Jewish name along with their new Christian beliefs, which is true for the founder of Jews for Jesus. Einstein's casting of the New Testament as a deeply Jewish book contrasted sharply with the major 19th century translations. Uh, Martha Shmuel Bergman's widely circulated Dasnaya Testament, which is from, uh, the first edition was London in 1887, generally stayed very close to Luther. Bergman's disciples addressed Jesus as Lehrer, which is German for teacher, and his title for the Book of Acts following Luther is the Apostelgeschichte, or the Apostelgeschichte. Einspruch's disciples, on the other hand, called Jesus Rebbe, Rabbi, and the Book of Acts is rendered as Die Meissen von die Schlichen, a title with significantly more Jewish and even Hasidic resonances. So I know that some, if you don't know Yiddish, you, you, don't, you don't hear the difference between the translating into basically a German term and one with very deep um, religious, Jewish religious resonances. So Meissen is, is, means the tale, and it's used for Hasidic tales. So in this case, the Book of Acts is basically like a book of Hasidic tales, and that is sort of comes across in Einspruch's translation. Maybe these other examples will uh, be more, it, it get through. It, it, it's hard to talk about this to people who don't know Yiddish, but I'll give you another example, where Jesus at the Last Supper took bread and blessed it in the King James Version um, and in Morfka uh, Bergman's version, Einspruch's Yeshua makes a, ma a bracha over the matzah. So Jesus is eating matzah in, um, in Einspruch as opposed to bread. The seven angels in the book of Revelation blow seven trumpets on, ju on Judgment Day. Einspruch's angels are apparently Jewish because they blow seven shofars. Even Einspruch's Hebraisms are more idiomatic than the Sulkins and Ginsburg. When Jesus comes to fulfill the Torah in Matthew 5, the Hebrew has limalot et Torah, kind of a very literal uh, translation of to fulfill, while Einspruch is faithful to Jewish idiom in having Jesus mekayim their Torah. Um, which is the uh, uh, idiomatic way that someone will refer to someone as a kind of observant Jew. Jesus was an observant Jew in an idiomatic Jewish language. In these and other decisions, Einspruch was reflecting not only on strictly linguistic or exegetical issues, but ult ultimately on the relationship between Jews and Christians, Judaism and Christianity. Um, but there's also a lack of sympathetic resonance between the New Testament and Jewish culture, which is already embedded in the text and not just a product of its reception history over 2,000 years of polemical argument. For all the Heimishness of a Hebrew or Yiddish speaking uh, Jesus, the, let's just say the Gospel of John is quite challenging to Jewish ears and neither Salkinson Ginsburg nor Einspruch could do much to render John's report about the Jews, Hayyudim or Diyidin, who were persecuting Jesus, more palatable to Jewish ears. But if the Yiddish Gospel of John posed a challenge uh, for attracting Jewish readers, it did have the virtue of reflecting its, own trans its translator's own charged circumstances. The notion that Judaism and Christianity are rival siblings or twins battling even before their birth has deep roots both in rabbinic and patristic sources. But with the parting of the ways, the sibling rivalry became largely metaphorical, except perhaps in the case of Jewish converts to Christianity. For Einspruch, the son of a Sanzer Chassid, the adoption of Christianity brought him into open conflict with actual relatives 
friends, former friends, parents, brothers, comrades, colleagues. After his time at the seminary, Einspruch did not distance himself from Jews, but rather took up residence in the very heart of Baltimore's Jewish neighborhood, apparently reveling in the proximity of Jews, while no doubt, I think we can take it for granted, also absorbing their abuse. The book of John, in which the Jews cruelly persecute a good Jewish man whose only crime is that he yearns to redeem their souls, may have been an expression of Einspruch's own experience of Christianity, rather than just a challenge to his ability to attract Jewish readers. It's not John, but rather Paul, I would argue, that posed the greatest challenge for Jewish Christian translators. As Martin Buber points out, Paul's theology rests heavily on a prior mistranslation in the Septuagint, the first Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, in which the Hebrew word Torah, which means everything, is rendered in the Greek as nomos, which means law. Torah means so much more than law. Without this change in the Greek sense, Martin Buber writes, the Pauline dualism of law and faith, life from works and life from grace, would miss its most important presupposition. For translators of Paul into Hebrew or Yiddish, nomos seemed to find a ready equivalent in the term Torah, restoring the Jewish concept that lay originally behind nomos. You don't have to deal with the problem of nomos because just turn it back into Torah. The return to Torah indeed works beautifully when Jesus speaks of himself as the fulfillment of the Torah. It's a beautiful meaning. It means teaching, it means life, it means a way of living. But the strategy falls apart when it's Paul who's doing the talking. Pauline theology sets itself up not as the fulfillment of, but rather the victory over the law. And it's only the narrower term that allows Paul to see nomos as something so unpleasant that humans need to be rescued from it. Translation history, that is, cannot be so easily reversed once a community of interpretation has been built on it. When Paul's third letter to the Galatians assures his readers that Christ redeemed them from the curse of the law, the Hebrew or Yiddish translation renders Paul not less but more difficult to understand for his Jewish, if not his Galatian, readers. As Einspruch renders this pivotal theological claim, Mashiach hat uns eiskeleist von der Klala, von der Teure. Or in Salkinson Ginsburg, ha Mashiach pada et nafshenu me kililat ha Torah. Let me translate into Yinglish. Mashiach saved us from the curse of the Torah. Unlike the promise that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, this sentence makes no sense, combining recognizably Jewish terms in ways that their internal Jewish signific significations do not allow. Such, you just can't say it. It's not a recognizable Jewish sentence to say that there is something called the curse of the law. The curse of the Torah. The Torah is the tree of life, which we cling to. Um, it's, so I hope that, that the illogic of that comes through. Such ostensible recovery projects as Einspruch's Yiddish version of Galatians 3 may have attempted to demonstrate how embedded Pauline Christianity was within Jewish sources. But its more immediate effect is to render visible the chasm that separates Paul from the world of rabbinic values. Missionary translators had a double task, to mobilize the closeness of Judaism and Christianity wherever it existed, which was in many places, while sidestepping those places in which Judaism and Christianity, Jews and Christians, had gone their radically separate ways. While keeping, so, and they had to do so without the aid of, the aid of commentaries, 
as the Bible Society ruled. While keeping to the letter of this law, missionary translators managed to evade its spirit, conveying theologically charged material not only through translation choices, but also through epigraphs, advertisements, illustrations, and book covers. Thus, while missionaries focused their efforts on distributing the New Testament to Jews, since Jews could find their Hebrew Bibles elsewhere, the translations they circulated managed to telegraph the connection between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Both the Sinai Testament, Testament and the Ritz Hadasha opened with a well-chosen epigraph from Jeremiah, promising in Hebrew and Yiddish translation that God will establish the new covenant, Brit Kadasha, uh, with the house of Israel and Judah. That phrase appears five times in the New Testament, but by choosing their epigraph from the Hebrew Bible, Bergman and Einspruch strive to link the New Testament with a text more canonical for Jews. You see, it says in your holy book that there's going to be a New Testament making a theological and psychological claim on potential Jewish readers, these tactics let them know that the book they are holding has been promised by God to them in their Torah, however dangerous and unfamiliar the New Testament might feel to them. The strategies that characterize the Christian mission to the Jews reflected more than the theological sympathies or lack of sympathy between the religions. It was well known on both sides of the missionary enterprise that the Jews felt for Christianity a visceral distrust that was undoubtedly harder to overcome than the simple ignorance missionaries encountered in other places. The missionary report about Jews fighting for a New Testament on board a ship bound for America concluded with a much more believable complaint about a certain rabbi on board who tried to stop these Jews from even touching the book. Chaim Einspruch was unable to find an American Yiddish press willing to print his translation and was compelled to raise money to purchase his own press. The press was paid for by another convert and longtime supporter, Harriet Letterer, and it was donated to the National Yiddish Book Center in the 1980s. Jews tended to have a double relationship with Christian missionaries. On the one hand, rejection, hostility, and rage at the perceived threat of Christian mission. On the other hand, a prideful dismissal of the paltry numbers of converts that resulted from missionary efforts. In the 18th century, yeshiva boys searched out Christian Moller's abridged Yiddish New Testament and consigned nearly the entire print run to flames. And while we know from missionary reports that roughly three quarters of a million Yiddish New Testaments were distributed over the 19th and 20th century, a folkloric counter discourse describes this flood of books as having, been, as having ended up being used to wrap fish or worse. Levi Eshkol, attempting to quiet missionary anxiety, it's a quiet public anxiety about missionary activities in the State of Israel in a 1964 Knesset address, tried to put the issue in perspective. He thought it was hysterical of how Jews were so outraged at the presence of Christian missionaries in Israel. He said, in the two decades since the State of Israel was founded, um, at least 4,000 Christians and Muslims had converted to Judaism, and only 200 Jews had converted to either Christianity or Islam. And let me remind you that Jews take pride in making no attempt to proselytize. They still did better. But it seems to me, and I'm speaking for myself too, uh, the learning process of this project uh, that I went through in, in learning about this, um, it seems to me that Jews often fail to understand that, Jews, that missionaries don't necessarily count success by the number of converts they make. The missionary enterprise is not a business plan uh, based on a cost-benefit analysis, but rather an integral expression of evangelical identity. You have to do it. It doesn't matter if it succeeds. You've got to try. 
And translators generally saw the exegetical and literary exercises at the basis of their work as its own reward, even if they continued to hope that the uncanny effect of a Hebrew-speaking Matthew, or so help me, a Yiddish-speaking John, would not be lost on Jewish readers. For translator converts, the act of translation also established their sincerity and usefulness to their new communities and symbolically expressed the fantasy of Jewish-Christian reconciliation. Translation was thus a kind of a performance functioning as the embodiment of certain theological principles concerning the relationship between Jesus and Judaism, the Old and the New Testaments, the Hebrew underlining the, underlying the Greek of the Gospels, and so forth. Missioner, missionary translations like the Rusta Dasha in their textual conflation of Jewish language and Christian content were in this sense already achieved conversions, however paltry their effects in the real world. These translations as conversions could take different forms, first Germanizing the ugly uh, jargon of Yiddish speaking Jews in New Testament Yiddish, and then with the Einspruch's dramatic reversal of this technique, Judaizing Christianity by restoring to Jesus his original Jewish speech and world. The notion of, the Jewish, of Jewish New Testament translations as performance can help illuminate some of their odder features. Translation is usually understood as a procedure to bring source text that readers can't understand into a target language that they can. But New Testament translations directed to Jews seem to have a slightly different structure. For instance, the mission of the Society for Distributing Hebrew, Christian, it's Hebrew Scriptures to the Jews is to provide the bilingual Holy Scriptures to every Jewish home throughout the world without cost to the recipient. I'm very sorry to say that non-Jews have to pay $12 for the same translation, but if you go on their website and you click a box saying that you're Jewish, you get it for free. It's very nice to have a research project where your material comes for free. You say, I think I'm Jewish. The Hebrew-English version presently provided by the Society for the Distribution of Hebrew Scriptures is a revised version of the 1885 Salkinson Ginsburg New Testament printed alongside the King James Version. Given that this Bible is directed to, so let me just let you picture it. Here on the right side is the Hebrew New Testament. On the left side is the King James. I should have brought it. I actually brought the Einspruch. I just forgot to. I'll show it to you during the, the discussion afterwards. Given that this Bible is directed to English-speaking Jews, why not just provide an English New Testament? Why the insistence on a bilingual Hebrew English version? In my own bilingual New Testament, I have many, I should say, the fact that English is the language of communication is evident from the advertisement on the inside cover. The Holy Scripture, both Old and New Testament, were given to the world through the Jewish people. The world therefore owes them a great debt. Thank you. Wherever these scriptures have come, they have brought blessings of light, joy, and peace. Is it not sad to find in this 20th century so few Jews are familiar with their own book, the greatest contribution to the welfare of humanity? out of gratitude to the Jewish people for their gift of the Bible to us and in partial repayment of this debt, our debt, we desire to present to every Jewish home a copy of the New Testament. If this volume is acceptable to you, perhaps you will enable us to present it to others whom you may know would like to possess it by kindly sending us their names and addresses, I'll be collecting these, with their permission, <laughs> yours faithfully. Society for Distributing Hebrew Scripture. This letter timidly, modestly, and strategically presents the book as a gift rather than a threat. And then also notes that the gift is indeed not from Christians to Jews, but rather from Jews to Christians. But the fact that the letter is in English suggests that the Hebrew of this New Testament is not a medium of communication, but a message. Readers will presumably trust the Jewishness of the Hebrew alphabet, even if they can't understand it, 
and recognize a biblicism or two, even if they can barely follow it. Hebrew communicates Jewishness, sacredness, canonicity, exact, and familiarity, exactly what's needed to overcome the Christianity, otherness, and threat with which Jews have long associated the New Testament and Christianity. Communication card. There you go. Don't say Jesus Christ. That's, that's hard, I think, for missionaries. By placing the Hebrew text on the right-hand side, oh, I can't believe I don't have an image of that. Oh, well. Um, and the title page, where it would be in a Hebrew book, the Society for Distribution of Hebrew Strictures also hints that the Hebrew is the original. And the English, Yiddish, Hungarian, all the other languages they do bilingual New Testaments in, is the translation. Although both, of course, are translations, and the English translation is actually considerably older than the Hebrew pseudo-original, right? So the Hebrew is 1885, and the King James is 1604. <coughs> but we all know what's, you know, so they pretend that it's this Hebrew's original. Art designers participate in the project of forging a, new te a Jewish New Testament, fashioning books designed to look at home on a traditional Jewish bookshelf. The beautiful second edition of Einspruch's Briska Dasha, for instance, features a Star of David on the cover and is lavishly illustrated by artwork taken without permission from the instantly recognizable work of the Jewish illustrator Ephraim Moses Lillian. The cover gives no sign of any non-Jewish content unless one's read, one reads suspiciously and sees a cross hidden in the design. Do you see it? In the intersection between the two letters Bet and Chet, which to, together refer to the title the Bris Chadasha. If this is not entirely a product of my Jewish paranoia, this cross is achieved through purely Jewish means, through an overlap not between two wooden beams, but rather between two Hebrew letters. Such methods of concealment are everywhere evident in the history of the mission to the Jews, which often use methods that can only be called deceptive. Um, there are prefaces in which Jewish readers are addressed in the first person plural, we Jews, um, or in which the translator otherwise disguises the Hebrew nature of the text. But in the case of Einspruch's illustrated second edition, um, these methods also serve the function of conflating Jewish and Christian ideas and images, expressing Einspruch's fantasy of reconciling Jesus and his Jewish hope for followers, or perhaps his own Jewish past and Christian presence and present and future. Lillian's of contained a range of Jewish images, from representations of biblical scenes to modern images, and most famously, Zionist iconography. But the publishers of the second edition ignored images that might evoke Jewish life in first century um, Palestine, choosing instead from Lillian's representations of traditional European Jewish iconography, and more particularly, images of traditional Eastern European Jews. Thus, the letter to the Hebrews suggests that Paul was writing not to whoever the, Hebrew were, the Hebrews were in Paul's day, but rather to Jews in all generations to come, <coughs> including this one. <coughs> and the Besoyla, like Matthew, the, the gospel according to Matthew, opens with a rendering of a pious old Jewish man wearing a yarmulke and dressed in a prayer shawl, a talus, reading a traditional sacred book by candlelight, which, by the way, is a visual pun for the word sefer in the first line, which means a holy book. Um, and this is one of the very few instances in which Einspruch doesn't follow Yehoyash, who uses the word book. Uh, rather than Sefer in his translation of the Bible. Einspruch's translation choice and the illustration together signify that this is a Sefer, a holy book, and not a book, a secular book, much less a treif puzzle, which is the traditional way in which you talk about the New Testament in traditional Yiddish, which is a 
an unkosher thing that you shouldn't touch, um, which is how many of these potential readers would regard the New Testament. The image that opens Einspruch's New Testament is not an illustration of the text it accompanies, but rather an image of its ideal reception, imagining and in some ways supplying the traditional Jewish reader who will fulfill Einspruch's eschatological hope that Jews would embrace the New Testament as an authentic part of their heritage. The actual rather than imaginary reception of Einspruch's translation may be rather surprising. Despite the financial and logistical difficulties Einspruch encountered in getting his translation printed, when the translation finally appeared, it was greeted with admiration and enthusiasm in the Yiddish literary press. Einspruch got a particularly warm review from the Polish-Canadian Yiddish poet Melech Ravitch. That is a handsome dude, no? Just to be clear, despite his failure to, to submit to the baptismal font, Einspruch was not a liberal or progressive Jewish Christian, but rather a passionate believer in the dispensational millennialist creed in its Lutheran evangelical form, as well as a tireless and no doubt tiresome missionary. Rav Ravitch, on the other hand, was a secular Yiddish modernist, an atheist, a champion of Spinoza, a critic of Zionism and of traditional Judaism, who was committed to a worldly, cosmopolitan, diaspora Jewish nationalism. Never nevertheless, Ravitch's review makes no mention of Einspruch's missionary intent, focusing rather on the closeness of Einspruch's New Testament and Yehoshua's Yiddish translation of the Hebrew Bible. He calls the translation beautiful and the translator a master of the finest nuances of the Yiddish language. Ravitch delicately alludes to the charged nature of the content of this translation when he says, for well-known reasons, the New Testament has remained for many of us Jews a book sealed with seven seals, and that is truly a pity for to some 700 million people, it is a sacred work. A cultured person should know such a work. I recommend it to every intelligent Jew. This new trans translation, in Ravitch's view, was a welcome contribution to Yiddish literature, in some ways indeed a gift to the Jewish people. The positive reviews of Einspruch's translation are even more remarkable given the outcry that greeted the publication the year before of the English translation in the Nazarene, Sholem Asch's novel that explored the Jewishness of Jesus. Among other sins, Asch was accused of apostasy and of having written a piece of, prop of missionary propaganda. But apostasy, in Asch's case, had a secular Yiddishist meaning rather than a Jewish religious one. Ash, Ash's greatest sin was not proselytizing, he was not a Christian missionary, or a Christian in any sense, but rather having published first in the English translation. Einspruch, who actually was a missionary, purchased his own press to get around the boycott of his work. But when the Yiddish daily forwards turned down the serialized Yiddish version of Der Mann von Nazareth, the man from Nazareth, Ash took the treasonous route of finding an English translator. The different receptions of Ash and Einspruch must be understood less in the context of Jewish-Christian relations than within the project of modern Yiddish culture. The 20th century saw literary translations not only of the Hebrew Bible, but also of Byron, Dostoevsky, Goethe, Gogol, Hugo, Kipling, the Quran, Lao Tzu, Shakespeare, Shaw, Mark Twain, Oscar Wilde, Zola, and many others. On such a diverse work, work, uh, bookshelf, why not a Yiddish New Testament? In fact, modern Jewish intellectuals, artists, and writers often took a special interest in Christianity. The Yiddish literary reclamation of Jesus had many significations and motivations the Jewish entry and the European, into the European literary tradition, the assertion of Jewish literary cosmopolitanism, 
a bitterly ironic commentary on Christian persecution of Jews, the critique of Jewish prejudices against other religions, an embrace of, of Jesus' ethical principles, a rebellion against Jewish parochialism or the writer's own family, and an insistence on the Jewish roots of Christianity. What the Jewish use of, Jesus, of Christian images almost never did mean was apostasy. The term apostasy in the scale of secular Yiddish values was reserved for those who abandoned the project of enriching Yiddish culture. Those who actually became Christian could be forgiven as long as their Christianity took the form of a beautiful Yiddish style. Einspruch's missionary project resonated within modernist Yiddish culture for even more specifically, specific reasons. Einspruch shared with the secular Yiddish intelligentsia an appreciation for the literary, for Yiddish, I'm sorry, for a literary Yiddish freed from its dependence and subjugation to German. In the case of Einspruch, this appreciation served to construct a more Jewish Jesus. In the case of Yiddish modernists, it served to construct a national tongue of Jewish coherence and integrity. The rapprochement envis 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 oh, sorry, envisaged by convert translators on Jewish Christian religious grounds thus indeed took place, only not on the religious grounds Einspruch was plowing. Remarkably, even in the year of the Lord, 1941, the secular Yiddish poet was able to counter Einspruch's missionary hopes with something more powerful than dismissal or abuse. The implicit acknowledgement that Yiddish culture was commodious enough to welcome the contribution of even this Yiddish speaker, the cosmopolitan spinetist and the evangelical missionary spoke in a single voice, although only for the briefest moment. Thank you. We'll now have a discussion with, uh, with Professor Aaron Graham from the USF Lane Center. Uh, and I will read this Should I pass this around? New Testament. <laughs> I'm a Catholic theologian. Um, Actually, you know, like six lines in the New Testament. <laughs> Matthew 123 is one of them. There you go. Um, but um, I think that this conversation is so important, and so I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, so when I teach, I, uh, I occasionally teach on the Second Vatican Council and introduce students to the document on um, uh, the Catholic Church and other religions, and students are often genuinely surprised that the document makes, um, has sustained attention to the church's relationship to Judaism and that um, it unearths and rejects some specific anti-Semitic assumptions and students are generally surprised about that. So I think like looking at this history um, is so important, especially at a Catholic university where we're trying to figure out what it means to be Catholic and I think, you know, at a Catholic university and I just think that it's important to know our history with that respect. Especially kind of um, some of the specifics of um, how that played out in history. Like, um, I was fascinated by the the way that you talk about this um, sort of instrum uh, instrumentalist view that um, some uh, Christian missionaries had of Jews, as it gave them access to Hebrew language and also Jewish. Um, ritual and customs, and that that was part of this you know, strategic prioritization of Jewish converts. And um, it made me think about um, the uh, controversial practice of um, some Christians hosting um, satyrs in their homes, for example, like next week. Um, 
you know, not like the uh, social justice sayer that, that, that Jeremy oh, that mentioned. Was fine. Yeah, but you know, I'm thinking about like this, as you talk about this like tantalizing possibility of, kind of entering into Jesus's, um, you know, linguistic and cultural and religious worldview um, that seems to be behind that motivation that that, um, you know, also demonstrates some, in, in my view, these instrumentalist sort of uh, views. So um, if you'd like to comment on that, um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Does that kind of follow that impulse that we're seeing in these missionary yeah. drives? Well, I guess I would say just, if I have to say it in one sentence, that the, um, the special place that Jews have in the evangelical imagination is it's not just that all the Jews convert before the second coming, whatever all that stuff is, which is part of the millennialist, uh, the role that Jews play in the millennialist narrative, uh, which, by the way, Jews are very happy to instrumentalize, right? I mean, Jews, it, it's, uh, you know, Zionist or rabbi, when you turn, when you look at those evangelical TV shows, they often have some rabbi who's <coughs> giving the kosher sign to the kosher, kosher seal. And Israel in some ways benefits from being, playing that role in the evangelical imaginary. So I realize I'm no longer in the realm of one sentence. But the, the one sentence is that the special role has to do with the fact that Jews are not only the target of evangelical hopes, which is true for many people, for everybody, but also a kind of belong to a kind of dream of genetic origins, right? That somehow Jews have a special role in Christian origins. That you know, the Middle Ages, for, for a thousand years, basically Christians, there were barely any Christians that knew Hebrew. And the fantasy is that, you know, you talk to a Jew, oh, they've got that, you know, they look like Jesus, or they, they have, you know, they can pick up a phone and talk to God because they speak God's language, or whatever that fantasy is. Um, which is, I think, particularly acute I think for a Jewish Christian, it's particularly right there. I mean, there are a lot of ways to be a Christian, a Christian that have nothing to do with this fantasy, but if you're in the business of evangelizing Jews, the idea that you're not just you know, getting them to see the truth, but also um, recovering this primal wound in the body politic, which is the fact that Jews, this, this, this insult, which is Jesus' own people, at least some of them, maybe most of them, maybe, you know, basically we're, we're not as enthralled by this guy as other people were. How did that happen? And that's so upsetting. You want to make that good, I think. So I think that that's the, in some ways, and in some ways it's even, it's a bigger insult. You know, the insult is to hear that, that um, Jews you know, set fire to New Testaments or, or use them to wrap, wrap, wrap fish. But in some ways, it's an even bigger insult when, for my students, when they hear that Jews don't even, one of the things I like to ask my students is, what do you think Jews are taught about Christianity and about Jesus and about, and the answer is basically nothing. And nothing is so much worse than, it, it's so much more upsetting than nothing. I mean, it's called the greatest silence. You know, here's this great guy. We love him. He's our, you know, the son of God. He's, you know, you should know him. Your cousins. And I, growing up in a religious Jewish home, I never heard anyone say Jesus Christ in my hearing. I thought it was pronounced Jesus Christ because I'd only read it, Christ Christmas. So I, I didn't learn anything about Christianity. It's not like you go to Hebrew school and you're taught. So basically. We don't believe in the virgin. We're the people who don't believe in the virgin birth. We're the people who don't believe that Jesus is. No, I didn't know the virgin birth. Well, what's that? I had no idea. So G Jews carry on their own merry way, paying no attention to Christianity unless it gets in their way. In some ways, that's, I think that that's even more upsetting to Christians than, than disdain. Or, I mean, it is disdain than rejection. We don't even bother rejecting. Yeah, you know, it, it um, makes me think one of your, I, I, I thought one of the interesting points that you made about um, the, um, the lack of attention to fostering like, understanding and familiarity with the text and more just about performing one's own kind of theological 
interest that was behind this, um, uh, the way that these were tran the, the texts were translated. And I was thinking, it's also interesting, I would be suspect to a text that rejected the idea of commentary. You know, it's like, they're not, the, the attention wasn't to facilitate understanding, um, even with, it seems like a, a you know, non-Jewish um, targets of, of, of their missionary work, it was really about, you know, um, acting out that, um, that uh, missionary impulse and sort of reinforcing one's own narrative, I guess. Um, but, so one of the, the, the things that this really opened up to me um, uh, was just kind of a different way of thinking about uh, modern Jewish identity. Um, and I was so was just kind of fascinated by the reception of Weinsberg's um, uh, translation. And um, the, uh, the, the painting by Marc Chagall just made me think about how uh, that's uh, apparently Pope Francis's favorite painting. Um, and uh, when he became Pope, uh, the uh, um, institute, the Art Institute of Chicago, like sent it over to Rome. He had this he's special, my favorite Pope, by the yeah, way. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> um, Right? Yeah. yeah he's so he's not like favorite, favorite Pope. I think so. <laughs> um, but uh, and I, where am I going with this? Um, I I think that looking at the assertion. Of the Jewish Jesus from the perspective of um, you know someone who's also asserting like their their culture and their identity um, is different than looking at the construction of the Jewish Jesus that we see you know in this like theological right. performance. Right. And so I'm just you know I'd love to hear more about kind of what that. Um, you know, first, is this like an act of resistance to some, uh, uh, you know, kind of Christian dominance over the, the person of Jesus? And then what are the implications of that for yeah. how we can like, yeah. learn from each other and talk to each other? Great question. Can I just go back? I realize that I wanted to say something. I don't have any, by the way, I don't have any, I, it sounded a little snarky. I think it's very easy for Jews to sound snarky or on this ground. I don't have any, and you know, in other words, to play the game of the, the first religion or being, I, I basically buy Danny Boyard's view that the, um, two religions came out of the destruction of the temple, Judaism and rabbinic Judaism and Christianity. Both of them claim descent from biblical Israel. There's no reason to say that in some ways they they're in some ways Christianity is an older religion. It emerged in the first century, whereas rabbinic Judaism emerged in the second century. So uh, Paul saw it, uh, himself as a legitimate outgrowth of Israel. Um, and for Christians to to decide in the 20th, 21st century to have a Seder, right on. I mean, Jews don't own you know the rights to this, no copyright on the Seder. I don't think there's any problem of appropriation, just like I don't think there's any problem of Chagall uh, putting a picture of a basically a shtetl, Eastern European Jew, wearing a talus. Um, and I'm not surprised that, that the Pope likes it. Um, it. This was a project. It's basically the Holocaust put an end to. It, we think that this is the greatest moment. You know, 1962 and afterwards, the Vatican Council, the greatest moment in Jewish-Christian relations. But the radical nature of what was going on in Jewish, in Jewish culture in the interwar period among the avant-garde, in, in Yiddish, but also in other languages, and the way Jews were asserting themselves as part of European culture, in part by saying, we too, Christianity is part of our heritage. Mel Haravich, who gave, um, who gave uh, uh, Einspruch that great review, said it's time for us to have a new oral Torah, a new collection like the Talmud, and this time, we'll have some more writings in it, and what we're putting in there, I know for sure, is going to be the New Testament and Marx. And it's part of Jewish culture, part of the openness, worldliness, cosmopolitanism of Jewish culture, that we too have the stake in the history of Christianity and where it could go. Um, that project was foreclosed with the Holocaust, and you can almost date that for closing to a poem by Jakob Gladstein, a very important Yiddish modernist poet who wrote a lot about Christianity in a very dramatic and interesting way. 
um, and who wrote a poem in 1942 called Good, Good Night World, and it contains the, the lines, Good night world, I'm going back to the ghetto, goodbye Marx, goodbye Jesus, I'm hanging out with the Jews from now on. There was a feeling of uh, such, that Jews embraced European culture, including Christianity, with such, I mean, with compl you know, with complex feelings, but with such enthusiasm and such, I mean, amazing art. And in 1942, Glashan said, that's over. We are, you know, we're not interested anymore. Thank you very much. We understand that this love is not reciprocated. So that was 1942. 1962, in some ways, you know, the Catholic world wakes up to understanding that Jews are not just the people who are caricatured in John, but also their, their neighbors. Um, and has an awakening, but Jews really are still in a post-Holocaust, um, let's say, traumatic, introverted uh, moment, I think. And it's news to a lot of Jews that the interwar period was full of depictions of Christianity in a very positive light by Jews. And in some ways, the, um, I, I, mean, I think it's a really, it was an interesting project. It is the little echo of it that I've seen. In some ways, Danny Boyarin's uh, scholarship is, is a strong countercurrent. But also, there's a, a My Name is Usher Lev by Chaim Potak and Chagall himself, who continue to do this work, which isn't about Jewish Christian reconciliation in a way that denies the Holocaust, or that denies the suffering of Eastern European Jews, but the particular ways in which Jews feel about Christianity. But it's a recognition of the, the closeness of these religions that's so powerful, I think, on both sides. Does that answer yeah. the question? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes left for questions uh, with the audience. I'd like to open it up for students or community members that are here, U.S. faculty. Don't be shy. Ask me anything. Or ask Aaron anything. So this is not about New Testament. So this is not about Matthew 1.22, I don't know what that I'm sorry, um, if I heard you correctly, did you say um, Jesus spoke um, Hebrew? No. Oh. But it's a complicated question. So it, was that the whole question? No, so I, I was confused. I thought at one point you said um, his original language was... Um, I was quoting um, Robert Lindsay, the, the, the translator of Mark into Hebrew. A Baptist minister who translated, who said that he felt that he may have been hearing Jesus' original language. Um, now, the question of what language Jesus spoke is not completely settled, but the basic consensus is that it was Aramaic, which is a closely related language. And the reason why we think so is because there are a few passages in the New Testament that seem to be Jesus' direct speech. Talita kumi. Um, uh, is one young girl stand up? Um, Elia, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, which then is translated into Greek to another. So, and, and we also know that the language of, um, you know, in Judea, this, and in the Galilee, especially in the Galilee at this point, was probably Aramaic. Um, Hebrew had already stopped being a spoken language, but was, you know, the language of sacred scripture. So it's quoted in the New Testament in many places, but it does not seem to be the language of Jesus. So Robert Lindsay, or Bob Lindsay, as he's known in, in my slide, um, it seems to be a certain kind of uh, fantasy. There's a lot of these fantasies. So it, it, Christianity is a very interesting religion because it lacks, we don't know what the original, we don't know the New Testament did it have. You know, there's this theory that at least some of the Gospels were originally in Hebrew, maybe, or Aramaic, we don't know. Is that what you, the question was? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Other thank questions? you for uh, letting me clarify that. I have a question. Uh, the issue of wrapping fish with the, with the Jewish New Testament, is that, is there some kind of, uh, uh, no, is, is the, is the link to the, to the, the image of Jesus. 
they think the, the fish symbolism with, with Jesus. Oh, no, I don't think so. I don't think, I, no, no, the, the, it's just that we're talking about impoverished people who um, are given a free book. Um, you know, it's one of the things that comes to you for free. You don't even get a free Hebrew, you know, what do you get for free when you're Jewish? You don't get a free Hebrew Bible, you just get a free New Testament. So if you're poor, this is the book you have. It's, you know, there, there's three quarters of a million uh, circulated in the 19th and 20th century. That's a lot of New Testaments going around. When you want some paper, there's your New Testament. I think that's the idea. But as I said, this is folklore. I don't know if this actually ever happened. And the same is true about the Lord, the burning of the New Testament. The burning of the New Testament, I think we have um, better sources for, because that was a public event, as opposed to what somebody might be doing in their own shop or house. And that's in a book about um, uh, the mission missionaries by a woman named Aya Eliada, called a, a guy who speaks Yiddish, about Yiddish-speaking Christian missionaries. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, especially your dialogue the way the, the uh, review yes before. Um, uh, two things. First of all, that the issue of mission to the Jews has been part of, of the legacy of the Vatican too. I still remember uh, Abraham and Joshua Heschel in his memorandum. He was he wanted to have that accepted, but it took time later. Uh, that uh, this um, this particular um, part of the uh, Jewish agenda could be accepted, and I think we have to arrive to 2000 and uh, I guess one or two when Cosper in Jerusalem he was a cardinal prefect of the uh, one of the uh, dicastery of the Vatican said publicly that there is not such a thing as mission to the Jews because they are already part of the, of the people of God. It's something like uh, uh, the Star Wars the Redemption, Rosenzweig said, we don't need to go to the Father because we're already there. Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of movement. You are talking about evangelical Christians oh, quite often. There was something like that among Catholic, in the Catholic Church, but I think it's important to acknowledge that it's been a history after that. Yes. So I just want to underline this factor the other thing you mentioned, one author that I really appreciate, Daniel Boyering, because what he helped us to do is not only uh, how important for, at least uh, for me as a Christian professor, to tap and to uh, be knowledgeable of Jewish sources in order to understand Jesus. But at the same time, Boyer says it's important to know Christianity because it helps us to go back to the different forms of Judaism that there were at the time of Jesus. So it's reciprocal. It's not only one way. You need us, not we to you. No, it's reciprocal. Thank you. I mean, I don't think it's exactly symmetrical, but I do think, first of all, this is what I call Jewish supersessionism, resisting the urge to imagine oneself, as Christians often have, as a kind of origin of Christianity. And um, Eichbruch himself, the mission to the Jews was already losing popularity he was one of the reasons he couldn't find funding among the Lutheran Church was because they had already backed off from Jewish uh, the mission to the Jews already in the in the thirties, um, and it was understood that the mission to the Jews. I think Heschel said, "Do you really want the Jews to disappear? Is that what this is about?" Um, in other words, the uh, this is a form of genocide. You think of it as saving our souls. We think of it as genocide. Um, and I think he was heard loud and clear. Not in every corner of the Catholic Church, but um, certainly among many people. And I think the Holocaust uh, you know, had the effect of having people, having a Christian, the Christian mission, again, not everywhere, the Southern Baptist, whatever it's called, I forget the title. You know, it's not, it still hasn't abandoned in every, uh, uh, the mission to the Jews and all of its, um, all of its parts, but basically the, um, there has been a recognition of the problem of the mission to the Jews. But let's say it still exists. 
And, but, and, let, and maybe I'll just put in a plug for the World Bible Society. So one of the things that I should say is I, the World Bible Society, which is the descendant of the London Bible Society that I talked about, which was behind these missionary Bible translations, which supported and trained Bible translators and worked with people uh, writing translations that were directed to the Jews, and as I said, often had manipulative and deceptive tactics. That group, um, led by Eugene Nida, invited me to speak there this summer as a Eugene Nida professor. So this is what I call my mission to the Gentiles. Yeah. <laughs> and we have one question, Matthew. <laughs> Uh, so you talk a lot about um, Jewish and Christian relationship, and then you, you know we come into it contemporarily and today. And so I'd like to hear what you think like might be still lacking between this relationship between the Jewish community and Christian communities, or is what where we at today the end of the development between these relationships? What a great question. Thank you very much. I think that the most important thing right now is for Jews to learn from what Christians have gone through. So one of the things that, one of the most, uh, and this is part of what I experience every day at the Graduate Theological Union, which is the spectacle of Christian repentance. Um, I don't think that Jews need to repent for their attitudes towards Christians. I think that the attitudes towards Christians that I, in other words, Christian anti, Jewish anti-Christianity is, I think, uh, understandable and legitimate response to uh, the minority culture and the attacks that it was under. I don't have any feelings of the, uh, the need to repent. And that's what I meant by the asymmetry. But I do think that Jews need to repent for some things. I think that they need to repent and to recognize the suffering that was brought to Palestinians um, through, in some ways, uh, not through the fault of the Jews who escaped Europe because they were told Jews out of Europe go to Palestine but the Palestinians were not to blame for having a bunch of Jews dropped on them. Um, and the spectacle of a religious tradition able to see uh, its own flaws and face them so directly um, is something that Jews, I think, have, have, have a lot to learn from. Um, and it's been very inspiring to be around the types of Christians that and types of Catholics and Protestants that I've met in my work in the Graduate Theological Union, a meeting now with uh, Aaron that's embodied by the work, by this man's uh, comments. So um, in terms of the role that Jews play between Jews and Christians, um, I think, yes, we need to learn about Christianity. But in terms of the, if, if you want to see it in terms of repentance, which I think is appropriate, um, I think it's appropriate for, for people to take responsibility for the history of the religious traditions that they associate with. Um, not just, obviously, you guys out there that had nothing to do with the Inquisition. And yet, in some way, if you identify as Catholic, you have to identify with all that's part of that history. That Jews right now have some um, self-reflection to do. Um, and that it's, in some ways, hard for Jews to do it after the Holocaust and after seeing ourselves legitimately seeing ourselves as, in some way, the ultimate victims. Is there, can I just add one thing to that? Um, we're, we're adding in clock. Oh, sure. Right. Sorry. Well, I don't want to have the last no, word. It's not about you. I don't want to have the last word. But, but in addition to that, just to address your question, I think that there's also a real importance of um, uh, making sure that people understand the theological developments that have um, happened, you know, that have improved Jewish-Christian relations and understanding. So, you know, Paulo points out, like, the, the statements that have been made, um, you know, in terms of official Catholic teaching that have rejected um, some of the um, really anti-Jewish attitudes that, that Christianity has perpetuated. But um, I don't think that that's often um, translated liturgically, um, you know, I, I think of next week and how we're going to hear the passion in the Gospel of John and, you know, how many, um, you know, uh, religious leaders have stood up and, like, directly in that reading challenged the interpretation that a lot of us have inherited that is anti-Semitic. You know, I think one thing that you pointed out in, in your talk is how and a dominant interpretation so informs what we receive, even if it's just in the back of our minds directly combating that with good theology, I think, is also an area where um, 
we can develop. Well, that's a good last word. Thank you. Yeah. A plug for theology. Yeah. I'd like to thank you all for coming out and thank Professor Aaron Brigham for responding to this excellent paper by Professor Naomi Seidman. Uh, please join me in wishing Professor Seidman a happy birthday tomorrow. Yay! Yeah. Whose birthday is today? Someone's birthday is today. She's not with us oh. right, right now, but that's uh, we'll make sure her name one more time. <laughs> Monica Gabriel. Oh, the last word. Thank you all.